Does this look like a beaver to you? Well, it doesn't to me either, but we will find out what it is in a moment because this is Zuparade. <laughs> week at this time from the world famous Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago, where today our subject is a visit to the Pacific Northwest, including a visit to the fine Seattle Zoo. And here to start you on your visit is Marlon Perkins, director of the Lincoln Park Zoo. Hello there. I'm glad you could join us again today. Well, Jim Herbert's told you a little about our coming visit today to the great Northwest of the part of the United States. I think this is going to be a very interesting and exciting visit because this is an interesting and exciting part of our country. Let me show you where it's going to be. Go up to the map here and I'll show you that this, the storyline today goes right up the Pacific coast of the western part of this country from central California clear up to Alaska. And our trip will take in some of the beautiful territory of Alaska and uh, show some of the, the, uh, the largest carnivore in the world, the great brown bear. We're also going to show something of the fine Seattle Zoo in, uh, in uh, Seattle, Washington, which I visited just recently. Well, Jim, what was that question you had a little earlier? Well, it was about the animal we saw at the beginning. They, they called it, I guess, a beaver, but it didn't look like one to me particularly, and I thought maybe it was misnamed. Well, it, it, it is kind of misnamed. Let me show you what it is, Jim. I'll take the microphone and go over here to this cage where this fellow lives. He's called a mountain beaver for, for want of a better name for him because he isn't really a beaver. Could you possibly turn around over on this side? Don't do any biting now. Yeah, I can hear your teeth going. Lewis and Clark were the first white people to know about this particular beaver. And the Indians called it a suelo, or a shoto, or a squala, which was their name for this beaver who lives in the, in the, in the uh, high mountain valleys in this uh, northwestern country. He's a vegetarian and digs burrows in the ground and is more closely related to mice and rats than he is to beavers. He has almost no tail at all. And that's uh, a strange thing for an animal that is called a beaver, and one that's as uh, aggressive as this little fellow. He is just turning around here and trying to bite. You turn around and face the camera, because that is the place for you to look. Jim, these little fellows uh, are found in a very narrow strip here, just along the coast, from Washington right down through Oregon, and California to about central California. And so within the span of my hand is the territory uh, the, of these animals in the whole world. What they keeps them right there? Well, Jim, they stay there because there are mountains nearby and they can't get across the mountains. But uh, the biggest bears in the world, Jim, live in Alaska, in the far north. There is a place where, if you want to see the largest of all bears, you must go, as did Ben East, the field editor of Outdoor Life, right. who first saw this bear through the rangefinder of the camera that was taking this picture on a uh, slope on a mountainside on the snow. These bears are uh, attain a weight of about Oh, 1,400 to 1,600 pounds is the weight that's been recorded in most of the zoological literature. And they stand when they get up on their hind feet about, oh, eight to 10 feet high. He's the biggest carnivore in the whole world. That means he's a, an animal that preys on other animals, partly. You know, the diet of bears is, is pretty uh, varied. They're curious animals. And even when they're disturbed, like this one obviously is, at uh, some action on the part of the cameraman, he stops occasionally to look back and see what's going on. He thinks, maybe I better get the heck out of here, but at the same time, he uh, wants to look around once in a while, as do these bears who are feeding in a mountain valley, hear the queer of the camera. They both look up. The one on the right takes off for parts away from there. That's a female. 
The male uh, looks back, stands up to make sure, hmm. he thinks, yep, I too better get out of here, and takes off himself in the gentle direction of the other side of the mountain. <laughs> That's where they go. You bet. And uh, you see how they lope there? They're enormous big things. But here again, they're, they're curious. Wonder what it was that they saw back there. And if that thing that they saw is following them. These pictures were taken by Ben East at the end of the Alaskan Peninsula, near Cold Bay. You know, Jim, most people think that the Kodiak bear is the biggest of all bear. And he is one of the really big ones. And he's found from, uh, on the Kodiak Islands. Mm -hmm. But, uh, the whole group of them, there are several species, should be called great brown bears, and they are the greatest of all the bears. Well, over the hill for them, and let's find mother and young. She hears the whir of the camera, too. She says, kids, you beat it. Let's take off, <laughs> and I'll cover your retreat. They don't even stop to look back. But mother does, because if anything's chasing those cubs of hers, she's going to stop and have a, ha, have a look at them. But look at those rocks fly. She takes off after them. Boy, I wonder if they're following. And how about you kids? Come on now, let's go up to the top of the hill and see, what the, uh, see if we can get away from here. Now, you kids sneak on down there <laughs> while I take one last look, because we better get out of here. My own bears are mighty big animals out there, but are there any small animals, say, like birds that are peculiar to that section of the Pacific Northwest? Oh, yeah, Jim, there are quite a few. As a matter of fact, do you know the uh, passenger pigeon? You know the one that's... Oh, that's extinct now, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, uh -huh. There's a relative of this one found out in the Pacific Northwest called the band-tailed pigeon. He gets this name of uh, band-tail from the fact that when he's in flight, you can see a little faint band on the, on the tail. Now, these birds are resting quietly here, and I don't think we're going to have a chance to see the band on the tail. They're about the same size and uh, a dull coloration of uh, our common pigeons. But these pigeons, too, were at one time nearly extinct because they were slaughtered for the markets of the big cities of the Pacific coast. Rigid uh, laws, however, have protected them, and so they are now uh, making a good comeback, and there are some areas where you can see pretty good-sized flocks of these uh, pigeons. And like the passenger pigeon, these pigeons, too, lay only one egg at a time, oh. rarely two. And so they don't come back quickly, and that's the reason why it's possible for birds like these that nest in great flocks mm -hmm. to, to be exterminated quickly. Then, you know the little uh, uh, bobwhite quail that we oh, have? Sure. Very uh, you probably have hunted those. There's another one out on the west coast that is uh, uh, very much uh, like these, but uh, has a little top knot. Huh? These birds came in recently, Jim, uh, from the Seattle Zoo, and they have, uh, we had to frost over the top of the glass so that they wouldn't fly oh, at the yeah. glass and hurt themselves. And I'll have to go over there now and uh, wipe the front off so that you can see what I mean. You see, I'll slide in here quietly and take a cloth and wipe off a section slowly of this frosted glass area so that maybe you can peek through and see... Oh, take it easy, birds. That's it. So that you can peek through and see these birds if they're resting on the... I, I better wipe another one off over here. And uh, the least little kind of action on the part of new birds like these are will often cause these birds to fly up at the glass and injure themselves. And that's why we always frost over the glass with new arrivals the first time they're put into glass, like these valley quail or California quail, as they're called, which uh, are um, uh, members of these. Take it easy now, don't jump anymore. And uh, why we have to do this in order to, in order to uh, keep them from hurting themselves. And for just further protection, I'm going to lower the burlap in front. Marlon, over on the other side over there, I saw another bird, apparently from the Pacific Northwest, and occasion to me, it looks sort of like a jay. Well, Jim, you're getting pretty good at this animal business because those are jays. But not bright like the blue jay. No, these are stellar jays, mm -hmm. and these are jays that are found right there in that Pacific Northwest. They're found in the coniferous forests 
Pine uh, forest, is that? Yeah, pine and uh, juniper and, uh, and uh, oh, any of the, the ones, ones that, that have cones. Yeah, the ones that have cones. And you see they have a top knot. Is that what, what made you think they were jays? Yeah, the top knot, and just the general way in that long beak and uh, attitude, I think. Well, that, that is that they, these are typical jays. They're a big jay, dark in color, and a jay that you'll find uh, on, in this great Pacific Northwest region. So that uh, if you go out there, you'll see uh, that particular kind of jay in that small belt. Jim, there's only one poisonous snake in this whole country out there, and that's a rattler. That's enough, as far as I'm concerned. Well, yeah, but uh, he has a rattle on the end of his tail, and so that is a dead giveaway. Let me show you a rattlesnake and a Pacific uh, garter snake right over here in a cage, because I'd like to show you how you could perhaps identify the poisonous one from one of the non-poisonous of that area. Let me see now. I'll just uh, hold up a rattler first of all so that you can have a chance to see the, the rattles on the end of the tail. Mm. Now you stay right up on the stick there, old boy. And you see, this is called the Pacific rattlesnake. And like other rattlers, he does have a rattle on the end of his tail. And then, uh, just to make sure there are no poisonous ones within striking distance, I can reach in and take a hold of a, a garter snake, which is called the Pacific Coast Garter Snake. And he has stripes running lengthwise of his body, very much like our garter snakes has. And so he is one that you wouldn't have to be afraid of at all. This is one that, uh, like uh, the other snakes of that region, uh, you only have to look out for the poisonous one. And that one in this uh, Pacific Northwest region is the, the rattler. Jim, one of the rarest animals in this whole great Northwest territory, is one of the rarest animals in the world. Benny shot pictures of them. Those are the, are the great otters that live in the ocean. And uh, they're, they're the sea otters. And he, in order to find them, he had to first go up by boat way up into the Aleutian Islands. In the Aleutian Island area, the sea otters uh, now live in small colonies, but originally they were considered extinct. That is, they, we thought for a time that the sea otter was gone. They have come back, however, in recent years. And here we see one lying on a kelp bed, more or less relaxed, and they follow the kelp. Uh, he's on a little island. You can see the hind feet are webbed, and they're the ones that propel him along. Fellas, maybe you can sneak up there and get a good shot, a good close shot. Oh, I think he saw me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, up he comes. Alert, attentive. They're very wary animals because they've so been, been so mercifully slaughtered for their fine pelts, which is one of the greatest pelts in the world. They're like wire-haired otters. Yeah, they have a kind of a grisly appearance around the face there, don't they? Like oh, wire-haired dachshund. Uh-huh. Well, he's going to lie to back down there again and take it a little bit easy because this is, uh, he thinks maybe there isn't any danger after all. Those fellows aren't in sight. But when they go into the sea, they just come down to the edge and roll over. And when the next wave comes up, slide gently off into the water. Hmm. They swim with their hind feet and they carry their front feet up where they can scratch themselves <laughs> and where they can hold their food. The sea otters have come back onto places like the uh, small pod of otter onto the coast of uh, California at Monterey. And there uh, have been larger numbers in, in uh, the Aleutian Islands. Recently, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service captured uh, three of them for the National Zoo in Washington. They were held in the Seattle Zoo, and I'd like to have you see them right here in the Seattle Zoo as they were resting on this long trip from the Aleutians to Washington, D.C. They're young otters, Jim, and here again you have a chance to see some of the characteristics that they displayed while they were uh, visiting at the Seattle Zoo. I think I saw their pictures in the newspaper and in uh, Time and Life magazine, didn't I? Yeah. One? Yeah, they're just this week. You've hey. probably seen them since they've been in Washington. And Billy Mann's got them out there now. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. And they're the only otters in captivity any place at the present time. There may be others for other zoos later on. They take life easy. 
Yeah, you see, one of the characteristics of these otters, Jim, is that they, they will lie on their back quite a bit. And their chest, then, is something that is very interesting to them because the chest, which they, they keep clean and which they scratch <laughs> and uh, rub around here, those, that's the place where they store their lunch. It's kind of a, a luncheon table, you might say. When they dive for sea urchins or crabs or oysters or something of this sort, they hold that on their chest until it is ready to, uh, until they, they finish eating. Those are wonderful so, pictures you took. Yeah, aren't they grand? Yeah. Well, this uh, all happened during my visit to the Seattle Zoo. And this is in Woodland Park, and so locally it's called the Woodland Park Zoo. I know Jim, I came I... in there uh, with a group of school children. <laughs> yeah, that's me. And uh, carrying my cameras, and as the children went off to the exhibits with their teacher, I walked up to the administration building to see the director of the zoo, Ed jo uh, Johnson, who came out to greet me with a friend. Well, look <laughs> who's here. Well, how do you do? You remind me of Dum Dum. We yeah, have a white-handed gibbon in yeah. our collection, too. Isn't she sweet? Certainly is. Well, they have a lot of monkeys there, Jim. And here's the place where the, where the monkey island uh, is and where the rhesus monkeys uh, live. They have all kinds of trees and limbs to jump up and down on. People can go clear around this exhibit on three sides and see the monkeys at very good advantage from nearly anywhere. Oh, boy, don't they have fun. Right outdoors with water moats, all kinds of rocks. Bobo lives in this zoo, too. Did you ever hear of Bobo the gorilla? Oh, is that Bobo? This is Bobo. Bobo is coming about four years old now. He weighs <laughs> now about <I> see him. <laughs> 65, about 85 pounds and is a fine, fine fellow. He was raised uh, as a pet in a home in the northwest part of this country until he got so big that he was tearing up the house. And then they thought the Seattle Zoo was a place for him. Looks like you was Sinbad back in the old days when Sinbad was about well, that He size. reminded me of Sinbad and of Irvin Young and of Lotus and of Raja, uh -huh. the four that we have here. But look at that face. Uh -huh. Isn't he a fine fellow? Uh -huh. Oh, boy, and so gentle. We played all morning. <laughs> we had more fun. Of course, his idea of play, you know, is to see if he can bite out some hair. Well, the children now are on their way to another exhibit, where the taper lives. That's what I thought that this was. This is the uh -huh. Malayan taper, Jim. It came into the zoo as a tiny little calf with spots all over it. And then when it got to be a year old, the spots were eliminated, and the broad band of white and black came across the, the mm. animal's body. This animal is about as big as a very large pig like a hamster, and has a huh? snout, something like an elephant's snout, but not as long. The camel uh, was the head man in his yard. He was puffing up his cheeks and showing us a mouthful of saliva, which seemed to say, look out, if you get too close, I'll let you have it. Not very nice. No. <laughs> well, he was certainly boss man in his paddock. His wife, on the other hand, was placidly chewing her cud over in the side, thoroughly convinced in her own mind that what he said when he puffed up his cheeks and got ready to spit, that he was going to be boss man in that yard. And no questions asked by her. They have a fine aviary here, Jim, a new building. And so Ed Johnson took me over to see that. Let's go inside, he said, and you'll see some old friends. And sure enough, I did. Oh. A white-throated toucan, a bird from South America with a great big bill. Then the emperor goose, who is a rare bird only found in Alaska. He's living with the cormorants, who have a much wider distribution. Mm. This is really quite a rare and interesting goose, the emperor goose. Golly, I wish we had one in our zoo, Jim. Yeah, they nice. Oh, my, isn't he a beauty? Certainly is. Handsome bird. He'd do well in our zoo rookery. Across the Pacific, uh, in the Dutch East Indies, lives originally the concave cask hornbill. And he's an old friend of mine. Mm. You'll see many of these in zoos around the country. They're not quite as rare, but they certainly are a fine exhibit. Wonderful to look at. The children are on their way out to the deer paddock where the Seattle Zoo has a fine herd of Axis deer from India. 
You see, that that's the one that has the spots throughout mm -hmm. life, Jim. Oh, it doesn't lose them when no, it does. No, it doesn't. No, and. Uh, they had this fine buck was a uh, headman of his herd, a great herd of uh, animals that, uh, uh, well, I think they must have had 20 of these Axis deer in that one paddock. Gee. And the kangaroos had a new house that uh, had windows right uh, on one side where the visitors could come and look right through the window at the animals. They lived there on rainy and cold days. Mm -hmm. They also had a big outdoor yard. They had kangaroo, wallaroo, and wallabies all together in this uh, one exhibit. And so you could have a chance to make fine comparisons size, between uh, all of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Active, interesting, jumping around. The bear pits are some of the best I've ever seen. Moated units with artificial rock in the background and fine specimens. Jim, look at that Himalayan bear stand up there, Just begging like the for ones peanuts. In Benny's pictures. Isn't he isn't fine? He is with a great white uh, chevron on his chest there. And the Kodiak bear, boy, he's a dandy. In fact, they have a pair of them here. And the male is something. He stood up full height, Jim, nearly 10 feet, and seemed to say, hey, kid, how about a peanut my way? <laughs> Is that what he said? You know, every bear <laughs> seems to have some kind of a trick to attract peanuts. Sure they do. The polar bears like their food in the water. And so they put on the fire hose and start the water going and move the food around on the surface. And when they see it, old man polar bear goes after it right in the water. And that means in the water. Slides right in. Isn't that great, Jim? White as they can be, happy, in the water, cool. The native black bear uh, was standing up begging for food, too. And like uh, many of the animals, you know, the farther north you get, the bigger they get. And so the black bear in the northwest are the biggest of all, except uh, one little group in Florida. I don't know why that is. And one down in Florida are bigger than yeah. these? Jim, these are some Kodiak bears that were destined for the, our sister zoo, the Brookfield Zoo. Oh, they're coming out here. And they were being rested at the Seattle Zoo, just like the otters were rested. Mm -hmm. And so I had a chance to see pictures of them, uh, see them, and uh, shot a few pictures, too. These now can be seen at the Brookfield Zoo near Chicago. And they'll grow up eventually to be great big things. The children were standing behind the guardrail and being separated by this great moat from the lions. They lived in a grass and um, old brush-controlled uh, area, that is, it had shrubs right. in it. And how about this for a sleepy old boy? That's a magnificent face, though. Oh, yeah. But with those bags, I don't know. <laughs> Isn't that little stone? That, uh, Fred Stone? That Fred is Stone. <laughs> <laughs> Fred Allen, you. Fred Allen? Fred Allen. That's okay. what, that's what you mean. Yeah. Isn't he a great one? He but certainly he, is. Then uh, <laughs> the uh, climbing cats, like the jaguar, have wire. And uh, the moat here in front of their exhibit is to keep the children and the people from getting too close and being injured by the claws that might come out through the wire, which is a brand new and very novel idea. Mm -hmm. Same is true for the puma, who is uh, lying on a, relaxing on his limb while the children are swinging down below. <laughs> relaxing on there. fun, yeah. <laughs> Different ideas of relaxation, you see. This is a, is a, is a great building. Here is the, the, uh, the bobcats, Jim. And they had about 12 bobcats in this outside enclosure. Here again, they had to have wire outdoors mm -hmm. because of the climbing abilities of these cats. But uh, this building is uh, a building that is unique. Uh, of all the buildings that I've ever seen in any zoo, they've used some of the best ideas and the best design in this feline building. Jim, for example, on the other side of the building, from these places, you can see cats like this oh, black leopard boy. and lions and tigers and jaguars and all of these cats behind nothing more than glass. Here's a, a, a very tough glass. I think they call it Herculite glass. And here is a full view of the front of the cage with tile backdrop, uh, uh, tile walls, uh, concrete floors, pools of water, but nothing but glass between you and the animals. That's handsome. Isn't this a great mm -hmm. thing? It is. Why? It's, it, you have no obstruction at all. You can see them perfectly. In fact, you can get up within <laughs> an inch of these animals. That's right. Just your the arm thickness around of the glass. <laughs> Here's a tiger. And uh, what a beautiful place to take pictures. You know, nothing in your way. The uh, 
he, he comes right up and poses nicely, just lying there, ju just a glass behind, and uh, licking his, his uh, paw. Well, comes right up to you, says hello, kind of sniffs. Isn't this a great thought? Was to have these animals just behind glass. Well, what's going to happen if that glass breaks? And I asked that question of Ed Johnson. So Ed said that they'd work that all out. If we'll go back behind, we'll catch the tiger in this uh, transfer cage, and he'll show us how this glass works. Okay, old man tiger walks in under his own power. We move the cage just a little bit and walk right into the cage itself. Here's Ed Johnson, the director, who's explaining all this. Walk right into the cage where the cat was, where the big tiger was. And he shows me how they've thought to protect this uh, cage in case there's an earthquake or uh, anybody breaks the glass, which is non-breakable glass, but still non-breakable things can be broken. They do it with an iron grill that's very cleverly held in place, out of sight, above the glass, inside the cage. It has a rubber cushion, oh, yeah. and it's, it's hooked up with an electrical device mm. that the minute that glass is broken, down will fall the glass and, uh, and she, uh, shut off the cage, you see? That's marvelous. Oh, it's that a very genius. clever device. Yeah. And uh, they, they will hold the animal. He couldn't get through this uh, heavy wire. And it's just a great thing. Well, in addition to that, they have outside pits. So let's move Mr. Tiger and uh, transfer him outside, where he has a great moat that is so wide that he can't uh, jump across it, and where the rocks are heated by electrical cable, and uh, where the teacher brings her children in front of the guardrail and says, children, uh, let's look at the uh, greatest, the largest of all the cats in the world, and starts to tell her natural history story of old man tiger, who is lying peacefully on warm concrete, artificial rocks, and uh, is, uh, and while the kids make faces at him, about all he can do is yawn passively. Well, that's the story. Uh, the end of our visit to the Seattle Zoo, and I, I know that the people there are very proud of it, and I hope you'll visit it when you go to Seattle. Well, Mom, there's one animal that we saw kind of fleetingly last week that I think is from the Pacific Northwest, too. I think we can see a little bit more of it this week, maybe. Huh? The black-tailed deer? Yeah, the little fawn. Let's go. Let's go over to the black-tailed deer and see this fellow over here, Jim. The young one that uh, Ed sent in to us to have a representative to show you here. And Jim, here is a, a bottle. And if you're hungry, kid, you can have a bottle and just help yourself. Can you catch it over here? So yeah, you, you want to hold it right there, Jim? So you can knock it out of your hand if you don't hold it tight. Got a good Move it a little away from the corner there now. Oh, 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 oh don't fall careful. out. That's yeah. a girl. This is a little different than our oh, white-tailed deer. She's got bigger ears, hasn't she, than the white-tailed deer? Uh-huh. Bang! Hey, she's hungry. <laughs> she's strong, isn't she? She certainly is. Uh -huh. And hungry. Beautiful, too. Isn't she going great? Well, Ed Johnson, she's doing fine here. And um, thanks very much for a great, great trip out there. Boy, yeah, We certainly it? enjoyed it ourselves, too, Marlon. And tell me, mm -hmm. what are we going to have on Zoo Parade next week? Well, Jim, uh, for the summer months, I'm going to be searching for new material for Zoo Parade. And so... For these next few weeks, we're going to show you the best of the Zoo Parade programs of this past year. Next week's program is Birds of Flight, in which we're going to compare the flight of birds with that of aeroplanes. That's next week on Zoo Parade, folks. I hope you'll all be with us then. Now this is Jim Hurlbut speaking, saying goodbye for Marlon Perkins, director of the Lincoln Park Zoo. Your technical director is Harry Mall. Zoo Parade is directed by Don Meyer, produced by Ronald Warrenrath, Jr., and came to you direct from the world-famous Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago.
This tall Douglas fir tree is a symbol of our great Pacific Northwest. And here is another Western emblem, the lion of the mountains, the cougar. Both are found in one of the finest zoos in the country, the Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle, Washington. You're visiting that zoo today because this is Zoo Parade. to you by Mutual of Omaha. Satisfied policy owners have made Mutual of Omaha the largest company in the world specializing in health and accident insurance. Hi, welcome to Seattle and the Woodland Park Zoo. This is our first zoo visit since our return home from Africa. And I think it's going to provide an exciting start for a new zoo parade system. You know, it's fall up here in the Pacific Northwest and I think that fall is a wonderful time of year to visit the zoo, a good time to wander over the grounds, to watch the animals in their attractively arranged dens and grottos that here are comfortably located all over the 92 acres of the zoo. Today we're going to concentrate on a couple of things at the Woodland Park Zoo that we found especially interesting. You're going to see two animals that we've never shown before live from any zoo. They're only found here in the Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle. They do very well here indeed. We're going to see Tony and Susie later on. The main part of our visit is going to be concerned with one of the most modern exhibits that Marlon and I have found anywhere in any zoo in the country. It's this new modern feline exhibit. And this tiger grotto that I'm standing near right now is just one of the attractive features of this feline exhibit. This grotto, as you can see, houses two active tigers, Sultana and Tongu. You can see that it's landscaped with shrubs, with grass, with saplings, has drinking fountains and pools for the animals. These dens are inhabited even in the coldest months. You see those imitation concrete rocks that you can see up behind there can be heated when the weather is chilly. Yes, this is just one wonderful exhibit that provides the utmost comfort for the animals and fine display for the visitors. But that's not all. These cats that you see out here live outside in these dens, but they also have quarters inside the feline house. And Marlon Perkins and zoo director Ed Johnson are in there standing by to start you on your tour of the feline house right now. All the tigers and all the other cats here at the Woodland Park Zoo have two homes, you might say. One outside, like Jim has just shown you, and another in an immaculate, tile, well-designed cage inside, like these here. Well, it's all a grand idea, and the man who keeps this idea in actual practice is the director of the Woodland Park Zoo, Ed Johnson. Ed, how long have you had this building? About four years, Byron. And uh, who designed it? Uh, we designed it right here at the zoo. Well, I'd say that's an example of excellent, intelligent planning. Uh, tell me about old uh, Tiger here. He looks to be in fine shape. Uh, what's his name? Uh, that's Kalanag. Kalanag? That's an odd name. Where did he get that name from? Uh, Kalanag, I believe in Indian, uh, means black snake. And uh, he, does he get that because of his snake-like actions, do you suppose? Oh, perhaps more, more, more so from his ferociousness, uh, oh. Say, Ed, you know it's been a long time since I've seen Tigers. Or at least it seems to me like it's been a long time because for the last three months, Jim and I and all the crew have been out in Africa filming uh, shows for uh, Zoo Parade for this winter. And you know, we didn't see a single tiger in all of Africa <laughs> along with all those other animals that we saw. Well, there's no wonder about that, Marlon. Most people think that tigers are native of Africa mm -hmm. when after all, they are only native of Asia. Yes, that's true. Uh, I don't think there are ever any tigers in in Africa at all. They are truly an Asiatic animal. Say, Marlon, I'd like to show you another Asiatic animal, a Siamese animal, so to speak. Mm -hmm. One that you'll instantly recognize. Yeah, little old taper down here, a little Asiatic taper. Say, he's quite a guy, isn't he? That's right. How old is he? He's about six or seven months old. And uh, what's he feeding on here? Well, he's having some fruit for the most part and some vegetable food there. He gets a little mash also. Uh -huh. You got a name for him? Well, we have a name. Uh -huh. His name is, uh, by the way, Knucklehead. Knucklehead? Knucklehead. I'm not sure I should ask you why <laughs> you named him that. Well, I think uh, you know partly so. As a rule, tapers are rather stupid and unintelligent. Uh, 
a stubborn animal, though. They are stubborn, <laughs> so, at least. They certainly little are. Little old knucklehead, if you're stubborn, I think you're a pretty interesting animal just the same. And I think you're going through a pretty interesting stage just now, too. Changing from your baby dress here with these uh, stripes and, and spots all over here to the uh, light-colored saddle of the adult. And uh, this happens be uh, because of the hair. Turn around here. We, do, we want to see all of you. This happens because the hair is shed, and when the new hair comes in, well, he, uh, that's it. Uh, it comes in in a new color. How fast is he growing, Ed? Well, actually, Marlon, he's gaining one pound per day. Well, he's actually see. gaining a pound a day. A pound per well, day. He's gaining that. Uh, then, in about two years, he should weigh about uh, five or six hundred pounds, which is the uh, normal we normal weight of an adult animal, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> well, old knucklehead, you're all right, but I think it's time for us to move along and see some other animals. We'll so, uh, see you when you get full grown. We'll come back and see you again. Marlon, I'd like to show you a native cat of this state. Okay. We have one that I, I know you are very familiar with. All right. Oh, yeah, the puma. Well, you know the puma has many names. Uh, what do you call him up here? Uh, we call him a cougar up here. Cougar? A local name here, yeah. a cougar. Mountain lion, El Leon. They have many names, uh, catamount. But whatever name they, they, you choose, uh, uh, they, I think uh, it's the same animal. Same animal, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. Say, tell me, uh, this, this is a very large one uh, here, uh, Ed. Uh, that uh, it reminds me that the largest of all the pumas come from this area of the United States, up that's, in the northwestern part of the country. That's right. And that follows a zoological law that uh, says that as you progress farther north in the uh, range of an animal, you will uh, uh, get larger animals. And uh, when the largest of the pumas, or the cougars, are found right up here in Washington State. How far away from the zoo did he come from? Well, uh, I, this particular specimen came from the Olympics. That's a range of mountains west of here. Uh -huh. Though it's not uncommon to find uh, a puma here, or a cougar, within 50 to, say, 75 miles from the city. Did you ever have one of them walk right in through your zoo grounds? Uh, not yet, Marlon. <laughs> well, Perhaps earlier in history. Yeah. Say, by the way, too, Marlon, you notice with uh, the cougars here, they're darker in color from this northwest uh -huh. than the uh, drier country varieties and the desert varieties. Yeah, see, down in Arizona, they're even reddish to match the red color down there. And I guess the dark color is in keeping also with the, the high humidity that you have here, isn't it? Uh, I imagine so. You I don't have so. many actual, in this country up here, many wild animals actually coming into your zoo, do you? Uh, no, we do have a raccoon occasionally. Yeah. Yes, even here, located uh -huh. as we are in the residential district. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the, the cougar uh, is a, a truly American animal. He's distributed all over North America and all over South America. And so, uh, coming from the great Northwest up here, and you see the great size of these, uh, these cougars up here. This is an animal that Americans can well be proud of, even though he is a predator. Predators are, are essential in the control of That's the right. other game. Well, I That's see right. Jim has joined us here, and I see he has two friendly and familiar friends there. <laughs> well, I'm not at all sure, Marlon, that they're friends, but by golly, they certainly are familiar. <laughs> You know, we saw lots of lions over in Africa, and it thrilled me all to get so close to them. Mm -hmm. I guess the closest we got was about maybe 50 feet, wasn't it? About four leaps away. Yeah, not any closer. <laughs> oh, but boy, right here, I'm getting a real close-up of this guy. Well, Jim, that's because of another excellent feature of this fine building, this uh, glass in front of the cages here. I've never seen lions displayed before with just glass separating them from the visitors. Well, it must take a powerful piece of glass to keep these powerful beasts in back of it there. How strong is this glass? Sir? Well, Jim, <coughs> this glass is designed to withstand an impact of, say, about 300 pounds at 30 miles an hour, mm. if you can imagine such a force. Well, well I have seen a tiger, a full-grown tiger, strike the glass, and the only result was just a dull thud. Well, Ed, what is this miracle glass? It's a glass called Flexiseal. It's actually a laminated glass composed of, of three layers, a quarter inch of plate on each side and a quarter inch of plastic in between, making three quarters of an inch. Uh -huh. But in the process of, of, of manufacture, it's heated and tempered to, to give it that great strength. Yeah. Ed, what, uh, what, what are the names of these two uh, lions? Well, uh, familiar names, uh, perhaps to you, uh, Marlon, they are Delilah and Samson. Well, familiar indeed, aren't they, Jim? Sure we are. have a Delilah and a Samson back at the Lincoln Park Zoo. 
And I'll bet you named Samson that because of his great size and strength, too, didn't you? That's true. That's true. You know, Samson is a splendid animal. Uh -huh. Uh, Jim, you're, you notice what a man he is? Yeah, I was just admiring it. We don't see him that way out in the bush out there. Yeah, and that's just the reason why. In the bush, there are all kinds of thorns and heavy growth, and as the lions walk through that heavy growth, they pull out the hair of their, of their mane. Mm -hmm. That is, the males. Of course, the females don't have a mane. But uh, this is a, a, a pretty great characteristic of lions. In captivity, they have a fine, flowing mane. It almost looks like this fellow's uh, been, been groomed. You don't groom him, do you, Ed? Uh, well, no, not, not hardly. <laughs> he's not <laughs> quite... Not, I don't he's, he's not that gentle, no. <laughs> not quite that gentle, eh? No, that's right. Well, uh, he's a handsome fellow, and I, I think he and our Samson would uh, almost be dead ringers, one for the other. Yes, They're both sure great, uh, great animals. Uh, say, uh, Marlon mm -hmm. and Jim, would you like to see the the operation, the utility operation, back of the scenes, so to oh, speak? Oh, well, well, I'd love to see them. that. Yeah, sure. Well, that sounds we'll like a great behind. idea, Ed. Let's do that in just a moment. Fine. You know, I've seen some strange things happening in zoos all over the world, but what's ha happening here in the Seattle Zoo uh, this today is something I think has never happened in any zoo before. Let's get Bob Denton to tell us what is going on. Well, Marlin, it is a little strange at that. Here is $1,400,000 in actual cash in a lion's cage. And these gentlemen over here are the armed guards from the Loomis Armored Car Company who brought the money here and who will return it to the vaults. And here on my left is Mr. Frank Jerome, president